Now, early on, Gournemant speaks about the founding of the Brotherhood by Titurel. This is part of the long exposition. And he says, when Titurel was searching out the foundations upon which the, the, the palace of Monsalvat would be built, he actually found Kundry down in the ground. This is page three, column one. Now, the really interesting aspect of that is the, the, the theme under current, there's this tumes, tumescent theme. And as the action goes on, this becomes specifically, it's actually one of the very few themes that does have a specific association. It is actually associated with sexual desire. It's the growth of sexual desire. Um, and Gournemans, also discovered her later after the catastrophic misfortune beyond the mountains. So we have two issues here relating to Kundry. One, she stands for, uh, for, for, for sexual desire. Secondly, she was clearly associated with an event that led to the gradual decline of the Brotherhood. And as the act goes on, we discover what that event was. And this was Amfortas, the leader of the Brotherhood, was seduced by a cruelly beautiful woman. And the long passages of exposition here make it explicit that Amfortas surrendered to sexual desire. And this desire is the cause of his festering wound, and it is the cause to of the knight's decline from the perfect brotherhood. Sex, it would appear, is at the root of the problem, as it is presented to us in Act One. Now, Parsifal, when he first appears, seems very much akin to the squires. He needlessly kills the swan. Out of sheer restlessness, perhaps, or misdirected energy, we don't know. But we do know that there is a basic violence in him, and we do associate this with some degree of immaturity. Um, he's also very akin to the, 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 the squires in his attitude towards Kundry. There's a moment where he, when he's actually the only thing that he can actually remember, or one of the very few things he can remember, is his mother's name, Herzleide. And when he mentions Herzleide, Kundry suddenly turns on him and tells him, your mother is dead. And his response to Kundry is very similar to the knight's response to Kundry a little bit earlier on. It's violent and it's, uh, uh, and it's most unpleasant. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
So we see a parallel between Kundry, uh, big pardon, between uh, uh, the Parsifal and the Squires. The Squires essentially have their growth um, stunted or blocked, uh, basically to their sort of um, difficulty in understanding uh, sexuality within themselves. In Parsifal's case, I'm not quite so sure if it's uh, overtly sexual. He's actually sort of been blocked in some way by the memories of his mother. But the first time he hears that his mother is dead, he responds in a very violent, and I think we would say, a very immature way. Now, the sexuality issue becomes more explicit in the temple scene that ends the act. This, of course, is dominated by Amfortas's agonized monologue in which the serenity that is offered to everybody by the Grail conflicts with his own sinning blood and the swirling conflict is destroying him. Essentially, there's this conflict between these, the, ideal, the idea of sort of a, a perfect unity and, and, and fulfillment in the Grail and his incapacity to reach that fulfillment because of <coughs> the, the, uh, the, the sexual experience that he had in the past that has never healed. Um, as has, all, has already been made clear, the wound in his side came from a, from a spear wound that was given to him as he made love to the fearsomely beautiful woman, who we assume is Kundri. Kundri has all sorts of different manifestations in this work. Um, but um, it's, it's also made by the spear, but the spear, of course, is also associated with Christ. And so we can see Amfortas is under, undergoing a debilitating conflict between the desire for purity on the one hand, which we assume is associated with the knights and the good ideals of the, of the Brotherhood, and, um, and, and, and wanting salvation in Christ, and then also his own physical desires that completely militate against these ideals. Here we have a, 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 an, an extract from uh, his, his um, uh, uh, from Amfortas's <laughs> Thank you. 
aspect of the world of Parsifal, and actually I think in the world of Wagner as a whole, is that the condition of our leaders is taken to be symbolic of the condition of those that they serve, live with, and rule. Um, 
It's a situation, I suppose, that's not too unfamiliar to us today. We feel that the condition of our leaders represents us, even though many of us might be unwilling to admit that. But we certainly do see sort of the, the, that, that leaders in many ways stand for the values and the situations that we find ourselves in. And Amfortas's condition is similar to that of the knights. The knights have inherited the festering lassitude. They've been condemned to a life of meaningless ritual that destroys and doesn't foster the brotherhood, that, 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 that in fact is that they're gradually declining. And yet interestingly enough, we're not actually told at this point what they are declining from or what's caused this decline. Because as far as we know, these brothers, these knights, are not actually engaging in the sexual indulgence that Amfortas did. And that's an interesting thing to hold on to because we're going to be told what it is that they're uh, de declining from a little bit later on. But certainly the world's in decline, the ritual of the Knights of the Grail is no longer effective, and energy, which we might perhaps interpret as faith, has left it. And as a result, ritual is draining, not regenerating, and it saps the energy rather than renews it. And the cause of this decline is the same as the cause of Tristan's decline, the wound dealt by sexual indulgence, in this case, Amfortas' encounter with Kundri, symbolized by the wound in his side, which will never heal. Um, Tristan seems never to escape from the winding labyrinth of his inner world, and Amfortas, whose kinship with Tristan Wagner noted, can never escape from the conflict between sexuality and religious aspiration. In actuality, the tragic hero of Parsifal is actually more appropriately Amfortas than Parsifal himself. Parsifal brings salvation, but it's Amfortas who actually realizes the real agonizing actuality of what it is to be a human being. Because in an exaggerated way, in a large, enlarged way, as is characteristic of tragedy, he actually does, in many ways, sort of embody the way in which we respond to these different dilemmas within ourselves. And all Amfortas can do is go through a series of repeated actions, slowly dying. Very much the view that Samuel Beckett had of the human condition about 60 to 70 years later. Okay, so uh, what I want to do now is see what happens to this theme in Act 2. Parsifal, of course, is not one of the knights. He is not a member of the Brotherhood. He actually has not engaged in the rituals of the Brotherhood. And throughout Act 1, um, he's distinguished by being identified with the perfect fool. Actually, I anticipate there, of course, we know, knowing Parsifal, that, uh, knowing the opera, that in fact he will be the perfect fool. But he is certainly anticipated as being the designated saviour of Amfortas and therefore of the knights. Here we just have that prophecy that is frequently repeated in Act 1. So from this, we can gather this strangely sort of quietening music has as a very sort of calming effect upon everybody on stage whenever it is sung, as if Parsifal is going to bring something special. Now, what is the salvation he offers to the knights? And how is that salvation realized in the course of the action of Act Two? Now, um, just me repeat, uh, Wagner 
um, gives us the sense of human beings caught in an endlessly repeating, debilitated spiral of, rep spiral of repetition that doesn't allow for growth, that keeps people tied to childhood, that we can see the knights caught in a, in a trap where their sexuality always remains potentially infantile and is never actually allowed to flourish. And the second act is devoted to an exploration of infantile sexuality and how to escape it. Um, the action is the Parsifal's rejection of the Flower Maidens, then of Kundry, and then of Klingzor. Now that sexuality is the central issue is clearly announced by the stormy prelude to Act 2, which takes that tumescent theme that I identified in Act 1 and makes it into a nightmare. Now, the sluggish, tumescent theme that was associated with Kundry in Act One here is active. It's rampaging through the orchestra and it's insistently repeated as if it's constantly sort of battering away at us, as if it's a force that one can hardly get away from. Now, Klingsor's castle, of course, is, to put it mildly, not a happy place. Um, Klingsor is a self castrator as he could not live the chaste life of the knights. He suffered the same problems that or Amfortus did, but he got rid of them by castrating himself, not the wise way to go. Um, and what he does is he now lives by witnessing others have sex and uses sex to destroy them. I think Klingsor is probably the most obvious pornographer in the whole of operatic literature. But anyway, Kundry is his instrument. She's an embodiment of all that is most terrifying and predatory in female sexuality. In other words, female sexuality is seen from the point of view of the male. She is the frail man's nightmare. And I could go into long details as to how Kundry, in fact, really hits at the nerve center of the Victorian age and Victorian ideas of sexuality. Although she's, though we have to um, observe that she is no happy figure herself. The first sound we hear from her in Act 2 is a scream, and it's a pretty blood-curdling scream. So we're not dealing here with a happy situation. Parsifal now comes to the castle, and what he's going to do is repeat Amfortas' uh, um, um, uh, attack upon the castle, uh, um, um, uh, a venture that, of course, failed because Amfortas fell in love instead. And, we, and I say, I think we would read Amfortas' failure as indicative of the failure of the knights as a whole. They cannot live up to the vow of chastity. And we, uh, we might ask ourselves, is this inability to live up to the vow of chastity the cause of the decline of the Brotherhood? Now, Parsifal has absolutely no problems entering the castle. He easily dispatches Klingsor's knights who are set to protect it. He arrives in the castle and he is greeted by the flower maidens. And they are no threat, they're delightful creatures to be played with. I think it is with the flower maidens that we see Wagner actually at his most sexist. 
Um, they are symbolic of the pure physical aspects of sex, of sex as a game. And mu the music is appropriately reminiscent of French opera comique. I won't play that because we'll be hearing it this afternoon. Um, but sex is a game, not a serious matter. Until suddenly, out of the middle of the flower maidens, appears Kundry. <laughs> This stunning coup de théâtre of that voice suddenly coming out of the Flower Maidens begins the most important sequence in the opera. And once we grasp what this sequence is about, we might begin to get to the problem of, of, of solving the problem of the knights. To this point, uh, to the point where, Pas where Kundry first comes onto the stage, Parsifal doesn't know his name. Now he does. It is Kundry who names Parsifal. And it's Kundry who links him to his mother. And, he's, and Parsifal says, while dreaming, this is, uh, this is where he, he, he got his name. We should note that Kundry is not a realistic character. She's not one human being. She's involved in the action in various ways. She's both a character and a chorus. She comments on the action. At times she serves as Parsifal's unconscious. And it's through her that he remembers his mother and be he becomes aware of the pain that he caused his mother, and he becomes aware that, that ultimately his mother died out of sheer um, absence. Uh, she just, in fact, died because Parsifal was no longer with her. But the crucial moment comes when Kundry turns essentially into the avatar of the mother, or maybe perhaps even the mother herself, because Kundry attempts to seduce Parsifal, and she, in so doing, reenacts the crisis that Amfortas went through some time before. And it's crucial in her speech, as she seduces or attempts to seduce Parsifal, she describes their love as a recreation of the love of his mother and father. And during their kiss, we hear that tumescent motive, the rising of sexual desire, that in this case is in, uh, articulated in a situation that is 99% explicitly incestuous. And at the moment when their bodies are about to fuse, at the moment we might say uh, the fulfillment of their coupling, Parsifal suddenly violently rejects her.
uh, this is the turning point of the action. It's the moment when Parseval discovers himself and he also understands the mystifying world he saw in Act One. By saying Amfortas, he recognizes how he and Amfortas have engaged in the same liaison, but he resisted where Amfortas succumbed. But he experiences the same pains as Amfortas, and as a result, this is crucial, he learns compassion for Amfortas. But he has also understood the troubling pains of sex, which are articulated in particular in the imagery of blood. One senses that at this moment, Parseval has grasped the root cause of the illness destroying the brotherhood. So it would appear at this point that the denial of sexual desire is what is going to save the brotherhood. But actually the solution is not that easy, and the denial of sexual desire is not a solution that Wagner would ever have chosen. Uh, Kundry begs Parseval to make love to her. She begs for salvation. She begs for salvation from the moment when she laughed at Christ, in which she committed scorn, which is the opposite of compassion. He fervently rejects her, and in so doing achieves another great moment of insight into the condition of the brotherhood. And this is the final section I'll be playing for this morning. Um, it's on page 16, column 1. <laughs> rather a sudden sort of uh, break off there, but it's rather difficult to break off. Uh, I'll um, talk a little bit more about that uh, when we begin this afternoon. Um, my this afternoon's talk will be um, much shorter than this one.
will be probably about sort of uh, 45 minutes, so we should have a good time for questions uh, this afternoon. Okay, thank you very much.